here's my my uh, uh, plan. Uh, I've stolen the title from Verity Bergman. Uh, much thanks. <laughs> um, it is it is a you know a statement of hope, um, but also perhaps of limits, since it invites us to think about what is possible in our time. Um, and I will be talking about a little bit about the different forms of of utopian thinking in, uh, or, or programmatic thinking in a minute. But I want first um, to acknowledge that we're meeting on the lands of the Gadigal people, um, who uh, toward, we, we are here at the, pretty much at the western end of, of Gadigal lands, and um, give my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, and that is, is meaningful for what I want to say, uh, not just a, 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 a formula. Uh, because one of the things I want to suggest is that we need to think about the grounding um, of alternative futures and particular socialist thought uh, in a way that has not been typical uh, of socialist and utopian thinking in the past. Uh, we need to consider place uh, we need to consider the situation in relation, the historic situation in relation to place and um, take that as a starting point for thinking about futures. So I want to start uh, my remarks by thinking about the Hunter region as the, <coughs> the, um, as the colonists called it uh, after one of the military commanders of the initial British invasion, um, and think about it as country, <coughs> as place where people live, and as meaningful in social terms. So uh, what we now think of as the Hunter Valley or the Hunter region <coughs> was for a very long part, for the majority of its history, uh, occupied by the Wanarua people and their neighbours. Uh, it was one of the rich settlement areas in, in Eastern Australia. Um, and uh, as I say, was, was occupied for a very long time and was therefore a site of, of cultural riches as well as economic. Um, but something happened there which is familiar across um, uh, colonial Australia, um, so much for the idea that uh, this was uh, unoccupied land or that the settled white settlement of Australia was peaceful. I'm sure I don't need to belabor that point, uh, that this was actually conquered land. Um, <clears throat> and in the conquered space, um, something very different developed from the indigenous relationship to country. What developed in the Hunter region under uh, colonial power uh, was an essentially extractive economy. Uh, firstly, uh, in the initial convict settlement, it was an outstation of the convict colony in Sydney, um, uh, partly drawn by the uh, coal on the surface uh, but also then fairly rapidly turning into an area of pastoral settlement with a little bit of small semi-peasant uh, occupation. But rapidly enough, the hunter, and especially the upper hunter, uh, became a part of the big man's frontier that was characteristic of Australian pastoralism, um, so that the, the dominant uh, local force in the, in the settler colony there uh, were the squatters, such as the White family, the family that eventually gave rise to Patrick White, um, <coughs> centred on their uh, famous uh, station, Beltries. Um, but as that moved up the valley, also the coal deposits in the lower valley were increasingly exploded, so we got a population of miners, uh, and with them, uh, in the later 19th century, uh, one of the centres of industrial militancy and union organising uh, in the Australian colonies, so politically important site uh, as well. 
Then in the 20th century, <coughs> uh, again because of the availability of coal, of relatively cheap coal, it was more uh, economic in, for colonial capitalists to bring iron ore to the coal rather than the coal to the iron ore, as is done now. Um, and therefore we got the development of the BHP steelworks um, in Newcastle and that became the centre. Uh, in fact, the centrepiece of a, a potential economic transformation of the whole Australian colonial area in the uh, aftermath of, of political independence or quasi-independence in the early 20th century. So Australia, like other parts of the global periphery, uh, moved into an economic development strategy of import replacement industrialisation uh, from the early 20th century through to about the 1970s. Uh, and this was the centre of it, the, 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 the material centre of it. So with this developed an urban working class on the familiar pattern of industrial working classes in other parts of the world. Um, but that didn't last either. Um, <coughs> In, from the 1970s on, <coughs> uh, the uh, development strategy of Australian, the Australian state uh, moved in the direction of deregulation of global south style neoliberalism, which basically meant a reorientation away from economic autonomy towards closer integration into international markets and looking for uh, therefore, a comparative advantage in global markets, which in Australia as a high wage colonial settlement uh, could not follow the, the uh, direction of, of a low wage economy that was followed in places like China and South Asia, um, but found the key uh, in the old colonial uh, industry of mining and uh, increasingly mechanised export agriculture. So that's become the centre of the Australian uh, economy in the last generation, uh, with the hunter again as a key driver of that, a key centre of that shift, uh, with those results that are, uh, are familiar to everyone who knows the hunter physically. Uh, that's an image of one of the, the open cut mines which is being circulated by Lock the Gates something that I'll, I'll invite you to think about again, uh, the social movements that are now characteristic of, of this kind of, of society. It's also very interesting that uh, now, if I'm, uh, I'm correct that this is still the case, the university is the biggest single employer in the region. So there has been an attempt to develop a service economy, but given the character of the Australian university system, also fitting in within the neoliberal development strategy of comparative advantage, that is depending for a significant part of its income on the sale of uh, study opportunities uh, to international students uh, at outrageous rates. <coughs> um, so that's... Uh, a, 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 a very sketchy uh, and imperfect attempt to, to suggest um, some of the things we need to take into account if we're thinking of place as a grounding for social and economic transformation uh, in relation to this, this particular region. I now want to think about the kind of, of larger situation <clears throat> that we find ourselves in in that region in, in, in Sydney and other parts of Australia. Um, and, uh, and here I confess this is not the first time I've tried to do this. Uh, I first tried to do this about 40 years ago uh, and the product was this, uh, a booklet called Socialism and Labour, um, which was uh, published, it got around a bit, at the time, it was funded by a consortium of left-wing unions um, and distributed uh, around the labour movement in New South Wales. I'll pass it around as an object of minor historical interest. <laughs> 
Um, it was an attempt to bring together, if you like, the kind of cultural radicalism of the new left of the 60s and 70s with the industrial strength of <coughs> industrial unionism, uh, with the social strength of industrial unionism in what I didn't recognise was, and very few people recognised, was actually the last stage of the import replacement industrialisation agenda. Because that died, that was beginning to die just at that point and was well, uh, well was then systematically demolished uh, by the Labour uh, government uh, under the influence of, of Paul Keating and John Stone uh, in the following decade. But that, uh, that shift has also made me rethink the kind of terms in which I was thinking about socialism, capitalism and so forth. And it seems to me that the demise of what theorists uh, had been calling organised capitalism in the post-war period, with an integration of state planning powers, uh, corporate uh, capitalism, uh, and relatively integrated union movements, <clears throat> that had given credibility to models of power uh, which were increasingly obsolete. And uh, I, I uh, now feel that one of our tasks as intellectuals in the current situation is to come up with new understandings of power, the distribution patterns, geometries of power uh, beyond those that were credible in the days of organised capitalism and, and the industrial uh, agenda, reform agendas in, in Australia. So we have to rethink our iconography um, from uh, those, those models of, of, uh, that were mostly developed in, in the global north and have, are increasingly now incredible. So it seems to me now uh, that we're in a situation where if we want to think about the, the world economy, uh, we can't think of an integrated system in the way that used to be relatively credible. Uh, we have to think rather of multiple systems of extraction, exploitation and oppression uh, which are loosely integrated and are themselves all in various ways unstable. Um, we have to think about power, the centres of power and surely there are major centres of power and power dynamics uh, going on, uh, very dire ones. Uh, as taking their current form as they try to ride the instabilities and uncertain integrations between different systems of exploitation uh, and oppression. So that when we think of the most powerful people in the world, sorry, that's, uh, I'm, I'm going a, a little bit backwards, uh, we're basically thinking of transnational executives there's not a great deal of ethnographic research on transnational corporate executives. A little hard to get in there, uh, to sit in the village square and listen to the gossip, as ethnographers are supposed to do. But we can get pictures, images, uh, partial understandings of them in a variety of ways. And one of the interesting things to me uh, is the extent to which the labour process of transnational corporate executives is now tied into corporate intranets. Uh, they are always on the computer. Uh, their their labour is actually surveilled just as much as ours is, maybe even more, uh, because it's working through corporate intranets all the time. And their task, to a very large extent, is trying to impose order, hence all the stuff about goals and metrics and so forth, on realities that are inherently disorderly, unstable, um, in, in, in ways that, that, that our theory has only limited ways of representing. And it's in that, um, that context, I think, that we need to think of the, the revival uh, of authoritarian patriarchies, uh, which is so visible in the political world uh, at the moment as another strategy from power holders and potential power holders to impose order uh, 
Um, I mean, think of the rhetoric of people like Tony Abbott in Australia at the moment. This constant sense that things are slipping away, that these cultural Marxists in universities are subverting the universities and the ruling class. They're getting into schools, they're subverting children. I mean, it's, it's lunatic stuff, but it conveys a sense of the, the intractability and out of controlness that these guys and these structures and these technologies of power are trying to wheel back and get into order so as to sustain the flow of privileges and domination. And that's, uh, I think, an important part of the context of the rise of private police forces, which now outnumber uh, state police forces very considerably, uh, at least in, in rich economies and in other parts of the world, of course, paramilitary forces can be much larger than, than state military forces too. So in, this is also a context in which new strategies of exploitation um, uh, have become prominent, um, much of which follows a strategy that I think of, you know, with the Hunter region in mind, as mining not the earth, not, not the, the, the country anymore, but mining the social, uh, mining the social institutions which have been developed collectively uh, by the labour and, and commitment of, uh, of enormous numbers of people over long stretches of time, but which are now being mined as sources of profit. And I think that's, in very broad terms, what's been happening to universities that, uh, in effect, the, the social institutions of universities and higher education uh, have been made available as, uh, as a source of profit uh, and privilege uh, in a way that, that simply was not true uh, of uh, public university systems a couple of generations ago. And then also, I think those, those considerations also um, suggest reasons for the element of insecurity that's so important in contemporary politics. Uh, something I'm sure, I'm sure everyone in this room is, is very familiar with. As the holders of power uh, <coughs> and the managers of, of, of corporate institutions mine our social institutions for profit, uh, they reduce the capacity of those institutions to perform uh, services for collective needs and the insecurity in a variety of ways uh, of large numbers of the population falls. And that is an important part of the context uh, of the growth of a, a, a much sharper politics of fear. Um, now anyone who's studied Australian politics is aware that that threat ideas, uh, fear of intrusion, invasion, uh, other races arriving in Australia. This is a long, long tradition going back at least to the 1840s. Um, and when I did my PhD on, on how Australian children learnt about politics, that was one of the things that leapt out in the 1960s, the pervasiveness of fear schemas <coughs> in, in the popular imagination of, of, of political issues. Um, but this is, has recently been intensified, has, has risen and spread. It's, it's definitely uh, transnational. Um, and again, the responses to this are ones that have been mobilised uh, to quite a large extent uh, by power holders trying to find their own uh, resources uh, and, and points of stability. Uh, in, a, in a shifting landscape. Hence we get the, the weird politics of border protection, the revival of a, a kind of a particularly rigid kind of hegemonic masculinity as a, as a, um, uh, a, 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 a form of, of um, performative politics, I suppose you, you, you might say. Uh, and, of course, the, the widespread revival of racism and various ver variations on racism that connect, uh, that, uh, connect racism with religious prejudice or, or a sense of religious difference. Uh, 
And again, I hardly need to remind people here of the power of uh, this kind of politics uh, in Australian, uh, in recent Australian history, concentration camp at, at, at Manus, for instance. So th these are, to my mind, uh, key features of the broader situation with we're, we're now in, in which older models of socialism and labour are no longer effective. They may be so a resource for ideas, for thinking, certainly. Um, I, I don't uh, by any means think we, we should abandon the traditions of socialist thought uh, or, or organising, uh, but we need more. We need much more now. We need new models of resistance and models of, of social change. So, <coughs> um, having learnt by experience that... Um, uh, it's it's a dangerous business to to offer um, strategies. Um, uh, I, I'm I'm going to be a little less bold than I was in in writing that old pamphlet, um, and and suggest uh, not a strategy but some bases of strategy. Some some of the things we need to take into account in thinking forward towards cooperative society uh, in Australia. And there are four uh, points, starting points that I, that I want to suggest. Uh, one is that, uh, that the country itself. Um, so uh, everyone who went to primary school in Australia will be familiar with the poem, uh, or verse at least, it starts, I love a sun, well, it starts with an evocation of the English countryside and then goes on in the second stanza uh, to say, I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, of rugged mountain ranges, of droughts and flooding rains. Um, Dorothea McKellar, um, and uh, perhaps the best known poem ever written. Uh, by, by an Australian, completely banal uh, as poetry, but interesting in its evocation of country by a member of, you know, intellectual of the white settler population. Uh, there is something going on there, um, which is interesting. Um, among other things, it's pointing to the fact of enormous renewable energy sources in Australia in the form of sunshine, uh, which sunburnt the country. Um, not actually a trivial point, but <clears throat> that implicit relationship to country uh, that's evoked there, I think is really interesting and suggests there are points in settler colonial country where contact can be made with indigenous sense of country and with indigenous knowledge of country and the kinds of responsibility um, that uh, indigenous populations had. Uh, in their relationship with country. So to my mind, this is, this is where I'm really speculating madly, um, it's pointing towards a kind of grounded socialism in the quite literal sense, socialism that is related to particular country um, and which may then take different forms uh, in different regions, not only of the world but within uh, within the boundaries of the Australian nation state. That's my first thought. The, the sunburnt country itself is an important resource that we should be thinking about. Secondly, know how. The know how of the Australian population in all its diversity, including the old British to the boot heels settler population that I come from. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, here's a, a, an iconic uh, moment uh, in the, uh, the life of large numbers of members of that uh, settler colonial population. Uh, the Hills Hoist uh, used to be quite an icon of identity for, for Australia. It's gone off a little bit now, but it's probably still recognisable. Do people know the marvellous Hills Hoist in the Indigenous... Uh, a collection of the um, uh, New South Wales Art Gallery. If you don't drop in someday and have a look at it, it's one of the nicest artworks I know. 
Um, but I want to point out not just the Hills Hoist, which is a little bit of local technology, locally appropriate technology uh, for the suburban backyard of the uh, suburban expansion of the 1920s and then uh, the bigger one of the 1940s and 50s, but also what's around it. This is food production. So the quarter acre block uh, wasn't a, you know, a trivial idea. Um, the household was a productive unit, like the rural household from which indeed part of the population of the suburbs came. It wasn't self-sustaining at all, but it, that was food production. You can see it there under the kids, the vegetable garden that was out the back, uh, which my parents always uh, had in w whatever house they were living in. They always planted vegetables. And I think many uh, of the generation who grew up in the Depression, as my parents did, uh, would, would never uh, have, have lived in a house without starting food production. Um, and uh, fruit trees over on the right, also characteristic. The lemon tree out the back of the, the house, very characteristic of that. So what I'm pointing to here is a kind of vernacular creativity uh, that is part of social traditions uh, in this country um, and, and which can, uh, can be built on uh, in many ways. Uh, one of the issues, I've recently been involved in a kind of sociology of knowledge exercise, uh, looking at new fields of knowledge uh, as they develop in southern tier countries, Brazil, South Africa and, and Australia. And one of the things we've been impressed by in our uh, research on this is the importance of local configurations of knowledge, uh, not, not whole epistemes, um, uh, but local formulations and, and hybridizations uh, of knowledge uh, are really important in areas like HIV, AIDS, uh, gender studies, or, or even climate change work. Um, so uh, the idea of, of, of knowledge as a resource has also a local and vernacular dimension. It's not all about high technology and the, the information society out of Silicon Valley. Uh, it's also local and widely produced. So that brings me to the issue of creativity. Um, I did mention the, uh, lock, the gate, lock the Gates movement. Uh, social movements, including the union movement, seem to be a very important site uh, of creative invention. Uh, although that's not usually the way they are seen. I've always thought of the union movement as to a very large extent an educational movement and the decline of, uh, of the union movement in the last generation is an important reason for the loss of political education uh, in, in, in Australia and other, other countries where the union movement has been damaged. Uh, but there are also um, sort of greater concentrations of, of creativity, if you like, in artistic and artisan cultures, uh, which exist in, in Australian cities and in at least some rural areas, um, and which seem to me important resources for a do-it-yourself approach to, to uh, social um, uh, change and, and the development of sustainable uh, economies. And then finally, so as not to overemphasize the, um, uh, the purely local, um, we should recognize that Australia is rich in world connections uh, with, the migrant, with the migrant populations um, that are such an important part demographically uh, of Australian life. Uh, and which give rise to their uh, specific forms of, of political innovation. Uh, here's one uh, from uh, International Women's Day demo marching down George Street in Sydney uh, a few years ago, uh, a solidarity group uh, involving uh, solidarity with Latin American feminism uh, and in opposition to the femicides in, in Juarez city in Mexico and the, the plague of, of, uh, of femicide in, in other parts of Latin America too. Uh, so there are forms of, uh, of transnational solidarity 
for which we have many bases uh, in Australia. And the South-South links also involve indigenous people because there is now a, a, a global uh, indigenous uh, political movement in which Australian indigenous communities have links with um, indigenous peoples in Aotearoa, New Zealand, of course, but also in the Americas um, and in, in parts of Asia too. <coughs> so these are resources that we have to build on um, in, in producing a more grounded uh, and more diverse vision uh, of socialism than, than tended to be the case in the past. So, uh, finally, coming back to Verities in my title, um, in our time, uh, is, it, uh, is all this you know, smoke blowing in the wind? Uh, and I think it is if we think of socialism as a fixed state utopia, as uh, 19th century novelists tended to do. Uh, but it's not smoke in the wind if we think uh, of socialism and radical democracy as uh, not a, a fixed state but rather a dynamic of change. Um, and in that case we can draw a good deal of emotional uh, sustenance from the exciting and creative things that happen around us now for all the direness of uh, global power and the trends that I was talking about before as the problems that we face. We still are seeing things like the Uluru Statement, like the victory in the, the marriage equality survey slash referendum, like the popularity of the change of the rules, um, uh, uh, um, campaign. Uh, these, these are things that we can uh, and should be trying to build on and, and, and can take uh, uh, sustenance from. So let me leave it there. Um, these are roses I grew in my own backyard. I'm glad to say.